Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Gannon. I'm the president and CEO of United Way of the Greater Capital Region. I'm really excited to um, be a part of this conversation on Friday afternoon, really our first time trying this with Women United and uh, an elected official here in the Capital Region who I personally admire and look up to in Senator Hinchy. Um, she, uh, we were just talking in the green room before we let the audience in uh, about the, uh, the political heritage she comes from, but um, what I admire about her most is how she's really um, carving her own path as an elected official and uh, excited to hear more about um, how that's going for her uh, today. Um, I'm coming to you from the Blake Annex, downtown Albany. If you haven't been down yet to check out this facility, uh, please uh, schedule a tour either with me or Angelique. You can do that at theblakeannex.org. Uh, nonprofits working better together. We have about 15 of them uh, working together under this roof and um, you know more to come too. In fact, there's somebody moving in now that I'm not even, I think, allowed to talk about yet, but um, I'll tell you guys that it's uh, an organization called Shred, which is uh, introducing kids in the inner city and in rural areas to uh, winter sports and uh, with everything that comes with it, character building and leadership training and pretty exciting. And they'll be working here with us out of the Blake Annex in downtown Albany. So uh, that's my plug for the day. Uh, another person, in addition to the Senator who I look up to and admire every day is Aaron Napoleon, our uh, lead on the Women United Affinity Group here at United Way of the Greater Capital Region. So. Uh, let me hand it off to her and uh, thank you to everyone for joining us today. And uh, here's Aaron. Go ahead, bud. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Senator Hinchy, for being here. And thank you, everybody else. I'm excited, elated that this was just an idea and a thought a few weeks ago. And the hard work behind United Wave, Greater Capital Region, Senator's office, this is just telling of the conversation wants to be heard. And what can we do about many of these priorities that we're going to be talking about? As Women United Advisor, I feel like I have one of the most fulfilling roles, and that is to be able to work alongside close to now 50 women, and we are growing and we are looking to grow. Um, we are industries in our field, and I'm sorry, we are leaders in our industry and leaders at home as well. Um, we are fortunate to be able to be here to start this conversation. Um, we, just this year, we decided that we wanted to focus our efforts on a problem that is affecting many people across the nation, and that is finding access to affordable and quality child care. I know we'll be touching on that. So if anybody is interested in the work that we're doing, this conversation we're having today is just a tip of the iceberg for our advocacy committee and the lane and the agenda that we want to help and support going forward. So we'll be um, putting ways that you can reach out, learn more about us. I do want to introduce Alicia Suarez. She'll be moderating this conversation with Senator Hinchy and Alicia is a pretty big deal herself. Prior to, um, Alicia is the head of operations at Suarez Physical Therapy. And prior to joining this past fall, she spent over a decade as practicing attorney, first as a government enforcement litigation associate focused on risk, compliance, and ethics with Ropes and Gray in Washington, DC. And then as an assistant US attorney for the Northern District of New York in Albany prosecuting violent crime cases. She joined Women United to part with other to partner with other like-minded women in the capital region and to help improve the lives of women and children in our community. Thank you, Alicia, for starting this. Thank you very much, Erin. Uh, and thank you, uh, Senator Hinchy, for joining us today. And I also gave uh, my thanks to all of the attendees that we have with us. It's great to see so many people on and um, interested in these topics. And we are very excited about this conversation today. Uh, but before we dive in, I just wanted to give uh, a little bit of a background, set the table for how this format will go today. In just a few minutes, Senator Hinchy will have the floor uh, when she, and she will give us a little bit more information about herself, um, her priorities for 2022 and some of the work she's done in the past, as well as some of her reactions um, to Governor Hochul's recent state of the state address and uh, some of the priorities and issues that were included in there and how those uh, and how she views those as well. 
We'll then open it up to questions. Uh, as Aaron mentioned, a focus of our group has been on childcare, and we have some questions in that area um, that some group members have provided to us already. And we also welcome questions from all attendees. So if you have any questions for Senator Hinchy as we are going, please feel free to drop them in the chat or in the question and, a question and answer sections. Our team will be monitoring those. And when we get to the question and answer period, I will go through and try to get to as many of those questions uh, as we can today. Our time is limited, so we may not get to all of them, but we will try to get to a number of those questions um, and get Senator Hinchy's answers on those. As uh, Peter Gannon said at the outset, this will probably be best, best viewed in speaker mode. So those of you didn't, didn't hear that initially, um, you might want to set your computer to that as we're going along here. Uh, as always, please be respectful to one another in the chat and with your questions. Um, we look forward to seeing those. And if at any time during the discussion, you have any interest in joining us in Women United, we'd love to have, uh, have you. Keep an eye on the chat for a link uh, that'll come up as we're going and you can click on the link and find your way there uh, to join us. So now that I have that out of the way, we welcome Senator Michelle Hinchy. Senator Hinchy is an upstate native from, the, from Saugerties, New York and a graduate of Cornell University. She was elected to the New York State Senate in 2020 when she made history as the youngest woman to represent an upstate district in the Democratic Majority Conference. She represents the 46th district, which includes all of Green and Montgomery counties and parts of Ulster, Schenectady, and Albany counties. She is the chair of the Senate Agriculture Committee and sits on a number of other committees as a member as well. Senator Hinchy is a communications veteran. Over the past 10 years, Senator Hinchy worked her way up as a communications executive in the technology and media fields. Earlier in her career, Senator Hinchy worked as a grassroots organizer on a New York ban fracking campaign and served on the Catskill Center for Conservation and Development Board, which fosters the environmental and economic well being of the region. Senator Hinchy fights for the future and the people who call our region home, no matter who stands in the way. Her father, uh, the late Assemblyman and Congressman Maurice Hinchy, taught Senator Hinchy the importance of community and to stand up for what's right, to work hard, and to never back down. Senator Hinchy, we welcome welcome you and thank you for joining us today. And now I'll turn it over to you. We look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you so much, Alicia and Aaron and Peter and everyone at the United Way. I'm so happy uh, to join you and so glad I guess I could be part of the first one of uh, the first iteration of this uh, new thing. I'm, I'm so honored to, to be a part of it. So thank you. Uh, yes, and thank you for that, that introduction and the bio. So I'm incredibly uh, honored to represent the, the new freshman senator for the 46th district, which encompasses five counties, all of, uh, all, sorry, all of Montgomery and Green counties and parts of uh, Schenectady, Albany and Ulster County. And what is so exciting about that for me is that we have a real way uh, to see just how different uh, and also the same life is for people across uh, upstate New York. We represent 44 towns uh, that is very rural to small cities like the city of Amsterdam, the city of Kingston, uh, and then of course, Gilderland, which in itself could be a, a small city. Uh, you know, in, in this year, we've been able to be really productive uh, in just a short period of time. Uh, I wanna give a shout out to my team uh, who without whom you know, we wouldn't be able to do all of the incredible work uh, that we do and that we've done in just a year. Uh, part of that includes uh, the biggest part of really the our state legislature is working on and passing the state budget. And the budget we passed last year in 2021 was the best budget for upstate New York that we have seen in recent history. Uh, specifically for our communities across the 46, we were able to bring in about $180 million in new and increased funding for things like our schools, for local roads, for the expansion of pre-K, which we'll talk about, 
uh, for small businesses, affordable housing, substance use disorder services, uh, and of course, agriculture, uh, among many other things. So that's something that we're we're really proud of because for the first time, uh, you know, in, in our area, upstate really has a, a strong coalition and a strong set of voices at the table. Uh, many of us in there were seven newly elected uh, freshman senators in 2020, um, many of us are actually from upstate communities. And so we've been able to really carve out space for the issues that we're facing uh, and that we're dealing here, uh, dealing with here. Uh, specifically on education funding, we had a huge year for education in the state government, uh, in the state Senate and the state government in, uh, in general. Uh, we had record school funding, which was $29.5 billion. Uh, and what that includes is a three-year phase in of foundation aid. Uh, many of you may know uh, foundation aid was a 30-year promise that uh, had not been delivered. Um, effectively, public schools were owed money from the state. And every year, they'd be told they were getting it. And every year, they wouldn't because there was no real plan to phase in uh, or complete the foundation aid, the money that was owed. What we did this past year was set up that three-year phase in to ensure that all school districts received the amount of money that they were owed going into the 2023 and 2024 school year. But, uh, what we were also able to do was uh, secure $105 million expansion of full-day four-year-old pre-K uh, for 210 school districts across the state that did not have access to funding for pre-K. Uh, that is huge because a majority of those uh, or all of those districts are outside of New York City. Uh, one thing you may not know is uh, years ago, there was an agreement where uh, New York City got full day four-year-old pre-K uh, and upstate New York, the rest of the state uh, basically got rebates uh, for homeowners. That deal has, or that expired, the rebates expired, uh, but the pre-K in the city continued. And so what we fought for really hard, many of our upstate members, uh, fought for the expansion of full day four-year-old pre-K for communities outside the city so that we'd have equity for uh, our children as well. We know how important uh, early education is. And we were able to secure that uh, as a first step going in uh, from last year. And so that's something that we'll continue to fight for and continue to expand uh, in this upcoming budget for this year. But we were able to put a real stake in the ground, making sure that kids, again, in 210 additional school districts were able to get four day four, uh, four, full day four-year-old pre-K. Generally, in our office, we proved to be uh, one of the most effective legislators, uh, definitely the most uh, effective freshmen. We passed 30 bills in both houses, in both the Senate and the Assembly. And I'm really proud to say that all 30 of those bills were signed by uh, both governors that we had last year. Uh, the last batch just signed by Governor Hopel in the last few weeks. Uh, and they span the gamut. Uh, from everything from increasing access to healthcare in our communities, to expanding broadband access, to expanding markets for farmers, and to working to fight uh, climate change. Uh, a few of those that I'll, I'll touch on here, uh, starting with our healthcare bills. Uh, we had four uh, healthcare bills that were signed into law. Uh, the first one was about establishing the Rural Ambulance Services Task Force. We know if you live uh, in upstate New York, we know that our EMS services are struggling. We know that our uh, volunteer firehouses are struggling uh, and that our ambulance services are struggling. Uh, we know that it has to do with recruitment and retention and payment and fees, uh, but we've never really gotten all that information into one formal place to be able to actually look at the data and move forward with uh, concrete legislation and regulations that may be able to help and really uh, secure our EMS and ambulance services in upstate New York. Uh, what our bill does is sets the first task force to study that uh, in the immediate uh, and to be able to uh, then give us concrete ideas and concrete tools that we can then act on to make sure that we are establishing uh, strong and concrete access to our rural ambulance services. Uh, the next one is something that is uh, very exciting to me because it was very confusing why we still had it. Uh, for some reason, New York State was the only state in the country that did not allow uh, our air ambulance paramedics to carry, distribute, or transfuse blood. 
Uh, you can imagine how big of an issue that would be for us in upstate New York. Uh, if you have a farming accident, if you are in a car accident, if you are hiking, God forbid something happens, you're in a remote area. Uh, many of our communities, uh, access to a hospital can be over an hour away. Uh, so if you need a blood transfusion on the spot, you need those first responders, especially there uh, are air ambulance paramedics to be able to do that. For some reason, New York State did not allow our air ambulance paramedics to do that. Uh, and a quick story out in uh, the Binghamton area, there was a farmer, a young farmer in his 30s, who uh, got into an equipment accident and was in the field alone. And finally, uh, after some time, his father found him, called 911. And the air ambulance that was scheduled to, or that would have the New York air ambul ambulance that would have come to help him was actually on a hospital hospital transport and could not make it. And because they were close enough to the Pennsylvania border, a Pennsylvania air ambulance service actually responded. They were able to give him a blood transfusion in the field. And while unfortunately he lost both of his legs, he survived and he's able to now spend the rest of his life with his wife and his two young daughters. Uh, had the New York ambulance uh, been called and had arrived at no fault of their own, there may have been a different outcome. Uh, so what we've done in our legislation is change those incredibly archaic regulations that now, and we now allow air ambulances to carry and transfuse blood, which will, we know, save lives across our state. We also have uh, two other bills, one that expands opportunities for organ and tissue donations, uh, and another one that requires all New York State shelters to provide free menstrual products uh, for people using their services. Right now, that is something in New York City, but that was not expanded to the rest of the state. We have now expanded that, making sure that anyone in the state who's using a shelter system has access to free menstrual products because everybody should be able to live uh, their life with dignity. Uh, Broadband was also a really important topic uh, of something that we focused on last year because we know in our communities, not everybody has access to reliable broadband, high-speed broadband. And a lot of that is because the infrastructure does not exist in our rural communities. Um, much of that is uh, because of cost, as well as because there was a number going around that said that New York State was 98% covered by internet. We know that that's not true. Uh, the reason the previous governor and others were citing that, st uh, that statistic was because they did that with census tracts. Uh, census tracts do not work for rural areas. We need household level data to understand where the gaps are so that we can accurately understand who is not currently served with access to the internet and how and make real plans on how we can build that infrastructure out. Uh, two things we did last year to make big inroads in that space was in the budget, we secured the first ever statewide broadband mapping survey uh, that made sure that we are that directs the PSC to actually get household level data. And I'm happy to say that the PSC is working on that study right now. Uh, we also got them obviously to include ways to conduct that study that are not you don't need the internet for. Uh, originally, that was part of that plan. And obviously, if you don't have the internet, you cannot complete a study on the internet. Uh, so we now have a hotline set up as well as mailings going out to people. Uh, and this is a, a plug that if you know anyone or you yourself uh, at home do not have reliable access to the internet, please call our office. Uh, we can help you complete that survey uh, and make sure that your voice is heard so that we can get real accurate data to actually solve this problem so that everyone can get online. Uh, we also passed a bill that was recently uh, signed by the governor to make it easier for small broadband companies to build out internet services uh, everywhere, but specifically in more rural communities. Uh, kind of a technical bill, but in short, uh, broadband companies have to negotiate individual poll contracts uh, to be able to connect their technology onto the poles. So if you're in a rural area, you know you have to connect to many poles. That's a lot of different negotiations, incredibly time consuming. Uh, and also what we saw was that utility companies were waiting for independent broadband companies to come into attack, uh, say they wanted to attach, build out broadband attached to their poles. And then they would charge them the cost to replace the entire pole as opposed to just the attachment fee. These small broadband companies often operate on grants and they do not have enough money to be able to upfront those costs. Men, to do that for each poll sometimes could be $20,000, $30,000, $40,000. Uh, 
30,000, 40, 50,000 dollars, that adds up very quickly if you're building out in places like the hill towns. Uh, and so what we did in this bill was say that you cannot charge the independent broadband companies uh, or change the structure fee uh, and working with the governors, and the PSC to change the structure fee to make it more affordable uh, for independent companies to actually attach to poles and also allowing them to opt into municipal contracts for all the utility poles in one municipality, as opposed to having to negotiate individually uh, for each one. We know that that is going to fundamentally change uh, and immediately change access to build out. Uh, and we're really excited with all of the money that's coming from the federal infrastructure bill, uh, specifically for broadband, uh, having that money in time for these, uh, both the mapping study as well as our infrastructure bill being signed, uh, it is going to mean that immediately people can start getting access to the internet, which is really exciting as soon as that money comes down. Uh, and of course, I have the incredible privilege of chairing the Agriculture Committee. Uh, we've actually changed the name of the Agriculture Committee to the Agriculture and Food Committee to better connect the dots for people on what agriculture is. When you think about agriculture, if you don't come from a community uh, like ours, you don't drive through beautiful farmland, uh, you don't think about, you don't draw the connections between the food on your table and often the drink in your glass. Uh, sometimes you may think it's something ethereal that doesn't necessarily impact your life. Uh, but we know it does because everybody, no matter where you live, deserves to eat quality, locally sourced, healthy food. Uh, and we are an ag state here in New York. It's a $6 billion industry. We have to make sure that we are connecting our upstate farmers with people across the state, uh, but especially downstate, with need to get our healthy food into their homes. Uh, one bill that I'm incredibly proud uh, that we passed and was signed last year was expanding the Nourish New York program. Uh, which does just that. Uh, it was something, a program that came up through the height of COVID. It was a silver lining that uh, had the state buy surplus goods from farms. We all saw the pictures of farmers dumping milk and produce quite literally dying on the vine. Uh, what this bill did, or what this bill does, is take that surplus uh, food and also just additional markets. So not just surplus food anymore, but takes food from farmers, buys it, and then gives it for free to food banks and food pantries across the state. Uh, so that everyone can actually eat local food, no matter what your circumstance may be. Uh, we're really excited about that. We got $50 million in the budget last year, and we'll continue to work to make sure that that program is uh, even better funded so that everyone can actually access the food. And then it can be a new, real concrete market for our farmers who we know uh, are struggling and we have not paid enough attention to our upstate agricultural markets and to our farmers across the state. We have to do better. Uh, we have to keep them in business. So that way, uh, no matter where you are, you're eating locally sourced healthy food. Going into next year, uh, we're working on these priorities and more. Uh, but as we talk about uh, agriculture, just a couple priorities that we have uh, for the 2022 session uh, is expanding the farm to school program. Uh, right now, school districts can opt in to get farm fresh food for lunch, uh, but it does not include breakfast. And uh, we know that most people, most organizations, most schools are not buying food just for one meal, you're buying it in bulk. Uh, and so by expanding this program to breakfast, we're gonna ensure that more school districts can actually participate in this program and that more kids are eating fresh, healthy food. Uh, we're also really excited about the governor's proposal. This was something that we wanted to do. Uh, we're really excited about her proposal about shifting uh, the farm to school program over from SED into uh, Ag and Markets because Ag and Markets is obviously the organization and the agency that has the relationships with the farmers, has the relationships and understanding of the di distribution mechanisms as well as the distribution challenges. Uh, so they'll be able to really help schools uh, opt in and choose to opt into this program, which will be a game changer for our kids. Uh, we also have two bills that will update the state's procurement uh, laws for the first time since the 1970s, making it easier again for everyone in the state to eat local New York State food. The first one actually establishes the first ever food procurement goals for state agencies that spend over $2 million annually. So that's uh, organizations like DOCS or OMH. Uh, making sure that over the next five years, they are buying at least 20% of their food that they serve from New York State farms. The second one is the setting good food standards, it's the good food purchasing bill. Uh, right now, all state agencies can only purchase food from the lowest responsible bidder. What our bill does is say that you can actually use a vendor 
that is 10% higher, no more than 10% higher than the lowest responsible bidder, if that vendor takes into account and prioritizes a set of uh, good food purchasing standards, that is everything from racial equity to fair labor practices to environmental sustainability, uh, local economic benefit, animal welfare, and others. Uh, so we're really excited about that and think that for really the first time, we'll be bringing in our state values with our procurement process. And it will also, both of these bills will keep New York dollars local. They will keep New York dollars in our state, making sure that it's our farmers and our local communities that are benefiting from those contracts. Uh, one thing, to, one other final thing that we did uh, in agriculture was really tied together agriculture and the environment and the climate crisis. Uh, agriculture is a needs to be a cornerstone of our fight against the climate crisis. It is uh, really the largest, if not the only industry that can be fully carbon negative by sequestering carbon uh, with healthy soil practices in the soil. We passed a bill last year that was just recently signed by the governor as well, the Climate Resiliency and Soil Health Act, uh, which incentivizes and supports farmers who are using healthy soil practices uh, so that we can actually really hit the goals of the CLCPA. And I'm incredibly proud of that bill because it built a great coalition of our agricultural producers, the Farm Bureau's American Farmland Trust, with our leading environmental organizations, environmental advocates, Sina Cutson, and so many others who are doing the work to fight the climate crisis. This is a bill that brings everyone together to show that we really are better when we work together uh, to solve problems. Um, you know, so we've done some really exciting things uh, last year. We'll continue to build on those initiatives uh, and a couple more just priorities that we've got, especially in the healthcare space uh, for 2022, a few bills that we have that will be priorities for us. Uh, one is a new bill that we just introduced this week that increases access to emergency contraception for people across New York State. Uh, this bill will allow pharmacists and RNs to dispense emergency contraceptions uh, without needing a doctor's prescription. Uh, right now, you have to have an appointment, you need a prescription, that takes time. Uh, it, this bill will spare people from some of those conversations. It will spare people from the time uh, and you'll be able to actually access, should you need it, emergency contraception. Uh, in a time where we are seeing an attack on our on women's rights, on people's rights, on Roe v. Wade. Uh, and you know we have to do everything we can here in New York to make sure that we are expanding access uh, to healthcare. And so I'm incredibly proud that we have that bill that will do it along with another one that, di that directs the Department of Health to make information available to patients about procedures that are excluded from care uh, or excluded from their local hospitals. Uh, so this will be, if you are looking for a procedure, if you're looking for access to an abortion, if you're looking for uh, those kinds of services, you can know ahead of time what that hospital, what your local hospital provides before you walk in, make an appointment and, and uh, are already in seeking treatment. Uh, you'll know ahead of time. Right now that information is not available. Uh, those two bills together will help New York move forward uh, in real true equality uh, for, for women's rights, which I'm really excited about. Uh, we also have a bill that directs uh, DOH and OPWDD to study traumatic brain injury services across the state. This is actually something that came from a constituent, something uh, someone, a young girl, 16, uh, has a very extreme TBI. Uh, and she actually had to leave our community uh, and move to Long Island because the services here that she needed were not available. Uh, that is catastrophic. We need to be able to keep people in their communities. We need to know what services are available for people so that we can know where the gaps are and fill them appropriately. Uh, so we are working on a bill with uh, healthcare, uh, or sorry, with the health committee chair uh, and now outgoing assemblyman, but uh, assemblyman Godfried uh, on pushing that through and making that a priority because uh, we know we need to do a better job of taking care of people uh, with all types of disabilities, people who are differently abled, we have to do a better job, but we cannot do that if we do not know how the system is working. Um, I've talked a lot. I could keep going <laughs> on uh, different different topics. Uh, so many things uh, of importance that we're working on this year, but I wanna pause and make sure we've got some time uh, for questions. Sure, great, thank you. Um, thank you for that very thorough uh, background and all you've been doing, uh, it's truly remarkable how much you have um, been getting done as a freshman senator. Um, and, and so many of the 
things that you have touched on. I know at the outset we talked about um, childcare being a priority of ours, but so many of the areas you have touched on have come up for our group as priorities. Um, you know, getting food on the table, healthy food for children, um, which are family issues, women's issues um, that that come up a lot uh, in our group and. Uh, a number of the other issues you discussed. So I, I we do have some questions, um, none that have come up in the chat yet. So just uh, a note to attendees, if you do have any questions, feel free to drop them in there. But we'll start with some that we had. And then of course, if that spurs you uh, to think of another area that you haven't covered yet or that you wanna jump into, please uh, feel free to do so. Um, as, as a mom of a second grader, I, I was happy to hear about the farm to school program being expanded when my son comes home and tells me about the, all the donuts and sugary box cereals he's eating <laughs> for breakfast. But uh, it's, it's still wonderful that, that people are able to, you know, the schools are, are feeding children breakfast and lunch, but the push for healthy foods uh, uh, is great. Um, but just to kind of general background question for you before we get into more of the substantive issues. You made history uh, as, as um, being like, the youngest female to come in, in in your Democratic majority last year. Uh, as a younger woman um, in what has been a more predominantly male role, uh, could you share with us some of the challenges you face? I mean, clearly you're making great progress and inroads in what you've been doing, um, but for this group, um, and, and we have a larger audience with us, but Women United, we have a lot of women who are in, you know, more predominantly male roles and looking to, um, you know, break through glass ceilings and all of that. So uh, any challenges you face and how you go about tackling those and any advice that you have um, for women in that position would be great. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because you think, or at least, you know, for me coming into this, you think we're in, now we're in 2022 at the time, we were in 2020, 2019, and so many incredible women have broken so many glass ceilings, right? They've made so many inroads uh, throughout uh, nearly every industry that for me, it was, I didn't expect there to be, uh, I should have, but I didn't expect there to be that much pushback, uh, you know, for me as a young woman running uh, for this seat, uh, but there was. You know, I've been told, even when I was thinking of, of running, I was told to wait my turn, uh, to which I know they didn't say to men who were younger than me, who were looking to do it also, uh, because I heard their conversations. Um, you know, there were times uh, on the campaign, we had a very slim team, uh, it was myself and my campaign manager, who was a young man, uh, also younger than me. Uh, and we would go to events together, we'd go to meetings together, and people would direct all of their attention to him, uh, as opposed to talking to me. And uh, they would ask him the questions. They would think they were talking, like asking me a question, but I, it was too uncomfortable for them to kind of acknowledge me as the candidate and, uh, you know, not to, you know, kind of blow up his spot here, but he would even tell me he'd only worked for men before he had worked with me. And he said it was a really eye opening experience for him on really the misogyny that still exists uh, it, across communities because it made him uncomfortable, uh, of course, but because I'm sitting right there and it was, oh, it was palpable, uh, you know, people just generally not wanting to or not being able to engage with me as the person who would be their uh, state senator. And even flash forward, you know, we, we won the election or won, you know, we won the election and uh, we'd go to events and we'd go to meetings uh, all across our five counties. And the meeting would be for to introduce state senator Michelle Hinchy to the community to talk about this project. Uh, again, we ran a campaign for two years. My face is, is everywhere. You know, if you know, if you're holding an event, you probably know what I look like. Uh, and multiple times I have gone to events where people don't recognize that I am the senator. And well, I'll tell a quick story at one, I was wearing a, a mask that had the Senate seal on it. And uh, introduced, we, we walk in, we're there, and I introduced myself as Michelle. And we spent about five minutes talking. And finally, he said, so is the senator coming? Is the senator joining us? Or is it is it just us? And I kind of looked at him baff like baffled and was like, well, I am, I, I am the senator here. I, here I am, you know, just didn't mostly because of how young I look. I'm 34, um, you know, but for how young I, I look, you know, people really have a hard time uh, grasping it. And so, you know, we we see that 
all the time. And one thing I will say, my colleagues, my colleagues do not. My colleagues are incredible. Uh, they've been incredibly receptive uh, of all of us. We have a whole new young crop of people over the last couple of years uh, that have come into the state legislature. And especially by being someone who is as vocal as I am about uh, upstate issues, they are really uh, interested to hear from me. They're really interested to hear about what we're doing. Uh, but, you know, for people who are experiencing that, am I freezing? It looks like I might be freezing. It's, I think there's just a slight delay, but it's it's still pretty much coming through, I think. Okay, great. Talk about broadband issues here. We have them. <laughs> I'm in the in the middle of Midtown Kingston, and we still don't have reliable internet. So apologies, lots of work to do. Um, but you know what I would say is uh, to anyone who kind of faces that, it just keep going, you know, for every single person that we encounter, uh, for every frustrating conversation that we have, that's one person who will probably not make that mistake again, right? Uh, I know in the story that I told for the person who greeted us, is going to pay a lot more attention, you know, to, to women, especially women and young women who come through uh, who they're meeting. And, and you know, I, I think it's been, uh, you know, that part's been exciting to me to, while it can be frustrating in those moments, to know that we are continually moving the ball forward. There is still a lot of work to do uh, in this space that we have to keep doing it, you know, and uh, for every single person we encounter that we're changing hearts and minds uh, with every with every interaction. So, you know, I'll say the same thing as I chair the agriculture committee, you know, for, for some people, I might not be the person you think would chair the agriculture committee. And so we've had to really uh, make some inroads too of, of saying, listen, we hear you, we're here to work and do the work. And I think we, we've done a lot of, of good stuff in this space. And, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of farmers who tell me point blank, they were very skeptical of me being the chair of the committee. They were very nervous about me being the chair of the committee, uh, but they're thrilled now because we've brought them to the table. We held the first ever agricultural listening tour when we first got in. Uh, that was a two day, we did two different sessions uh, for two hours each where we invited farmers, farm businesses, organizations, advocacy groups from all over the state to come in and talk to not just me, but to our entire agriculture committee uh, so that we could hear their testimony on what the issues are and how we could be helpful and beneficial. Uh, that never happened before. No one had ever done that. Uh, we did. And I think part of the reason we did is because I am young and I am new and we're able to say what's not been done before. What do we need to do better? Uh, and I think people are now really seeing that, and that that's an advantage. Uh, and we've definitely been able to move the ball. And so I tell people, just keep going, take all of those frustrating conversations and know uh, that that will change uh, everyone's individual view of, of you and of women in general, especially young women. Right, great. Well, thank you for paving the way. And now I'm, I'm sure I know your record is speaking for itself. So you uh, have definitely chipped away and that'll get easier as it, as it goes to hopefully. Um, and it is great to hear that your colleagues are very um, receptive uh, and not uh, putting up a fight in that way. But <laughs> um, so just moving uh, into some of the more sub substantive areas and childcare uh, being one of them that we wanted to touch on. Um, we noticed uh, we had followed along a bit uh, on your Instagram and saw that you had recently gone out um, and, and you did a post on relating to childcare and the importance of it and gone out in the community to visit um, several local businesses, um, both childcare centers, home-based childcare. And we've been talking a lot as a group about, you know, approaches to um, more affordable childcare, um, there not being enough childcare spots available. Um, and we struggled with, as a group talking about it, um, you know, the fact that there are not a lot of childcare um, spots available, um, childcare is costly. And so even when spots are available, a lot of lower income families uh, cannot afford those spots. But at the same time, the pay for childcare workers is low. Um, and so that's leaving childcare centers uh, understaffed and possibly having to close. And so it's kind of this continual circle of, um, you know, not being able to afford the spaces, the spaces aren't available, not being able to afford workers and kind of how 
do you have any strategies? I know that's an area you had said you were looking into and looking to make progress in and coming up with a kind of better system for childcare, um, ways that you can kind of balance those things so that there are more spaces available, more affordable spaces available. And at the same time, childcare workers who are predominantly female and uh, women of color, that they are getting paid for the work that they're doing and making a fair wage uh, in this important field. Yeah, you know, the childcare is an incredibly important issue and it's about time that it is this prominent in our dialogue, not just at the state level, but of course at the federal level too. Uh, we, it's really, uh, such such a problem just generally uh, across our state. You know, uh, a couple of just quick statistics that all of you may know, about 1,500 child care providers in New York closed between April 2020 and last February. Uh, that's just 10 months. And what's even worse about that stat is it's not just because of the pandemic. Child care centers were closing, period, uh, before this was happening. Uh, and the Center for American Progress reports that 64% of New York families live in childcare deserts. That's much of our communities, right? So we are part of those statistics uh, and we have to do more. Uh, as you said, thank you. We did just bring, uh, we invited and we brought the chair of the Children and Families Committee, uh, Senator Jabari Brisport, to our area. He represents uh, parts of Brooklyn. We brought him into Greene County and Columbia County uh, to really see what childcare looks like in other parts of the state. Uh, you know, we had him meet both uh, at an in, in-home provider uh, location as well as a child care center uh, on the mountaintop. And, uh, you know, I think it, it highlighted a lot of needs. It highlighted the great work uh, that, as you said, it was uh, for these two places that these women were doing um, and really showed that there's a, a large breadth of issues that we really need to work on. Uh, things that highlighted were the need for startup grants to help those entering the field launch their businesses, uh, expanding access to daycares, uh, daycare providers with flexible hours because not everybody works just a traditional nine to five. Uh, we have to make childcare accessible and available for people who are working non-traditional hours. Uh, and also the importance of lessening state or burdensome state regulations so that providers can actually focus on caring for children instead of all of the hours of paperwork uh, that they end up having to do. So uh, those are things we're working on be, uh, after our visit. Uh, and again, uh, Senator Brisport toured uh, all over the state to see uh, what people are facing. He introduced legislation called the Universal Child Care Act, which I am really proud to co-sponsor. Uh, this is a bill that would make child care free statewide and would create new funding streams to support providers. Uh, so this is obviously a priority for us this year. And some of the uh, kind of concrete things, and of course, there's still more to be worked out as it pertains to funding. And uh, once the bill is introduced and it goes into conversations, uh, but what this bill really does is expand support for public sub subsidies for child care, creates these new funding streams to boost pay for providers, to direct more funds to providers to operate during non-traditional hours, to help build new physical infrastructures uh, if the providers need it, to expand or to build different spaces. Uh, and then also carve a real transition toward universal access uh, to childcare. So this is something that we're really focused on. It's something that many of my colleagues are really focused on. Uh, as I said, we represent the many of these childcare deserts. Uh, so if even if you can't afford it and it's incredibly expensive, I think it says if there's a family, a two parent family with one child could spend up to $15,000 a year on childcare minimum, uh, that's unbelievable. Uh, and that causes many people to leave the workforce, to take one parent out of the workforce, which then uh, has a whole different economic impact uh, in our local communities and especially our smaller upstate communities. So we have to solve this issue. I think this bill is a great start uh, and we'll continue to fight for it to make sure that everybody has access to and uh, also affordable access to childcare. Thank you. Um, that's that's great to hear. One thing we did note was that um, universal childcare uh, did not come up in the governor's state of the state. And so um, that was going to be one of our questions as to kind of where that stands and whether there was any you know, hope of getting this done in 2022. So it's, it's great to hear that you and your colleagues are working on that and trying to, to push that forward. Um, so your comment about women, you know, when uh, childcare is not affordable, 
women leaving the workforce actually uh, is a nice transition into one of the questions we got from an attendee, uh, Debbie Glover, who asked, uh, so COVID had, has highlighted many women's issues. Um, and I think one of those is, you know, more women leaving the workforce, higher unemployment rates. Um, and she is wondering what legislation is on the table to mitigate these issues. What are considerations uh, for what are becoming long-term impacts of COVID such as unemployment and what is being deemed the great re resignation um, from many industries? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that COVID showed a lot of people is that they have a lot more flexibility in the work they want to do, uh, for better or worse, right? I mean, and to be able to spend, I think it also kind of shifted individual priorities of saying, we don't have to live to work. We can actually spend more time with our families. Uh, that said, we're actually seeing in, in our areas and the areas that I represent, we are seeing record low unemployment levels. Uh, I don't want to misquote this number, but I, I was just with the Chamber of Commerce in Greene County, and we have in Greene County specifically, there's less unemployment uh, than there was this time pre-pandemic. Uh, so, you know, we have to figure out what and what that what that is, right? What that looks like, and how we bring more people in our communities. We have tons, uh, tons, and tons of uh, open jobs. We know there's a labor shortage. We I talk about that with my colleagues. Uh, a lot. How are we, um, how, what are we doing to really bring people in? What are we doing for uh, trades? How are we helping people uh, enter a workforce or maybe a different workforce that they didn't know about or think they'd want to be a part of prior? You know, there's uh, one program in the city of Albany that I love. Uh, it's the MAP program. It's run by the Building and Construction, the Greater Capital Region Building and Construction Trades Council, uh, that in partnership with the city of Albany, uh, and other organizations, they were able to acquire a building and set up a pre-apprenticeship program uh, for specifically uh, people uh, of different backgrounds, more diverse backgrounds, minority communities to enter the trades. Uh, they know they want to diversify. Uh, and so this is now a program that was working with people really living in the inner city of Albany uh, to get pathways and create these pre-apprenticeship programs, pathways into good paying middle-class uh, trades jobs, which really are the future. Uh, we need to put more of an emphasis on our trades. Uh, they are, as we said, great, great long-term jobs. Many of you look around uh, our communities are some of the most moved to communities uh, in the country. Uh, people are looking for contractors. They're looking for carpenters. They're looking for plumbers. They're looking for electricians. Uh, I know my friends who are in those fields are booked out about a year from now. Right. And they can, they're making great money. They can live very comfortably and they're begging for help. Uh, so we have to think about how we're expanding apprenticeship programs uh, and working with our trades to do that. And I think the MAP program is one of those things, which is a, an incredible program that's, again, bringing uh, people who maybe otherwise wouldn't have access or un really know how to get into the trades directly to their front doors. Uh, we're also working on a bill that establishes, I think we've entered it already, that establishes the New York State Youth and Agriculture and Entrepreneurship Summer Employment Program. Uh, which we know succession planning for our farms is critical. The average age of a farmer is about 57, uh, up to about 62, depending on where you are in the state. Uh, we have to get new and younger, more diverse people into agriculture and into farming uh, and into the farming trade. So we're looking at, uh, again, for this bill, really connecting uh, people and young people, uh, BIPOC farmers uh, into uh, the farming trade to be able to continue that moving forward. Great, great. Um, and so I'm going to switch gears uh, a little bit here, although it does uh, also relates to kind of outcomes of the pandemic and, and where we're headed. We have a couple of questions from attendees um, about um, e evictions and the, um, sorry, I'm just scrolling up here, the, the good cause eviction bill. Um, one of the questions was, what is your thoughts on the good cause eviction bill? And uh, I think a related question, another attendee uh, said that in her former state, the eviction moratorium, she recently moved to New York, her former state, the eviction moratorium has been extended. And do you anticipate the eviction moratorium in New York state being extended beyond January 5th, 2022, so that families can remain in their homes? So if you could uh, address the eviction issue uh, 
for us. Yep, thank you. Yeah, this is, listen, housing is a critical issue. And again, another issue that we, people should have been working on a much larger scale 10 years ago, uh, let alone now. We need, we do not have, especially in our communities in upstate, we do not have enough housing supply. Um, specifically on the moratorium, while the moratorium itself uh, isn't going to be extended. I think the governor and, and you know teams have been pretty clear on that. There is effectively, the ERAP program effectively serves as a temporary eviction moratorium. Uh, if you have had, if you can prove COVID hardship for a reason that you cannot pay your rent, if you are a tenant, you can uh, still apply. The ERAP portal actually just reopened a few days ago. Uh, you can still apply for ERAP. And once you have submitted that application, you cannot be evicted. Uh, until you've gone through, until there's been a, a court date to uh, hear through those uh, cases. So there is a still a temp, pretty much a temporary moratorium uh, in place, even though the quote unquote overarching moratorium is not continuing. The reason why it's not continuing is because that moratorium was really meant for the height of the economic crisis uh, at COVID. Uh, as we just talked about with jobs is when people were losing their jobs, they could not go into the workforce, businesses were shutting down, uh, we went into a full lockdown. Uh, people then, if they were not working, they were not getting paid, they could not pay their rent. Uh, we are, as we were just talking about, kind of on the other side of that economic crisis, uh, we are back to work. Uh, people can find jobs. I know, as I said, more there are more jobs than people right now in most of our areas, at least for much of what I represent. And so, uh, the really the moratorium for that reason, that point has kind of expired. Again, however, if there's still COVID hardship, you can apply for the ERAP program. Additionally, uh, the court system, for better or worse, is backed up about one to two years. Uh, and so there's going to be, it's not like on the 15th, there's going to be kind of this mass eviction movement as we hear a lot about. There are still many mechanisms in place uh, where people will be able to stay in their homes uh, longer than that period. And again, uh, I encourage everyone on this call or any organizations that you work for, uh, please have, if you know of clients or people or neighbors, uh, friends who have had COVID, uh, COVID hardship and have not got applied for the ERAP program, please do so. Uh, you can also call our office. We can help you do that. Uh, we can help anyone through that process. So please call us. I'll make sure that we put our numbers in the chat. Uh, so you can you can reach out and you can contact us and it, I mean call us even if you're outside of our district, but you can call your other representatives too. Uh, they will their offices will be able uh, to help you. Great, thank you so much and thank you for those resources. So one thing to add on that too, there's also homeowner assistance. Uh, so there is also the LRAP program. I just want to be I want to make sure I have the whole ecosystem uh, in this space. There is also there's the ERAP program for tenants to apply. And then there's the LRAP program for landlords to apply. If you are a small landlord and you, for some reason, your tenants didn't apply uh, for the ERAP program, maybe they moved uh, before they applied and then you were left with however many months of unpaid rent or uh, un tragically, hopefully not, but possibly maybe someone, you know, passed away in this time from COVID or you have someone who didn't want to participate for whatever reason that may be. A small landlord can apply for the LRAP program also for funds uh, to cover that back rent, even if the tenant is not uh, a part of it. Uh, and then there's also the homeowner assistance fund too, uh, for people possibly facing foreclosure uh, and other other uh, homeowner issues. So again, if you are you fall into any of those categories uh, and just want more information, call our office. Uh, we will help you get it. Uh, we've been doing a big push, as you've, I'm sure, seen today, the governor asking the federal government for more money for the ERAP program and the LRAP program. Uh, right now, for the ERAP program, uh, all of the money has been allocated. But even so, if you apply, even if you end up not getting that money, if you apply, you still have temporary eviction moratorium through that space, a temporary eviction stay. Um, but there are many states that have not actually used all the federal money uh, in the programs that they set up similar to ours. Uh, we actually didn't get enough from the federal government uh, for the need that we have. And so the state legislature, as well as the governor have been lobbying the federal government to see if there are states out there who have after pretty much a year, you have not used your funds, you're probably not gonna use it. Hopefully you don't need it. Uh, and that's why you haven't used it, but they're probably not gonna get that money out the door. Uh, we are asking the federal government to reappropriate that money that hasn't been used in other states 
to New York so that we can replenish those funds and get that money into the hands of tenants and landlords who need it. Got it. Thank you. Very helpful. And I do see um, that the senator's number has been dropped in the chat as well as a link there. So if anybody is looking for that, just go to the chat um, and you can find that there. So we are um, coming up on our hour here. I do have um, one more question from an attendee that I will um, put out there for you quickly. Um, I apologize if there were more attendee questions that we weren't able to get to today. And then I have just one final question for you and I'll get your final thoughts if you have just a few more minutes for us, Senator. Great. Uh, I do wanna be cognizant of your time and the time of the attendees. So the, the one additional attendee question um, says, I'm thrilled to hear of the bill requiring shelters to provide free access to feminine hygiene products. Will that bill also provide shelters with funding to do so as their budgets are so tight? Also, any thoughts to expand this requirement with funding to food pantries? So the bill itself does not have a fiscal, a set amount of money attached to it, but it does direct the state to pay or reimburse for it. Uh, so if you, uh, I get know anyone uh, in working in the shelter system, uh, they can, they should go back to the state and ask for that money to be reimbursed or at least, or ask for that money up front. Uh, and again, we can help if there's any questions on that to call our office also. Um, but this is not meant to be an additional expense for shelters. This is something the state is providing for clients of the shelter system. Okay, great. And uh, I don't, we have not talked about food pantries, but I'm very happy to explore that. We'll check it out. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so one last question I had for you is that, you know, Women United as a group, um, we've been exploring different ways to support um, legislative priorities that align with our priorities. And from the discussion today, you have a number of them, um, a number of bills that are out there, um, some things that you'll be pushing for and your colleagues will push, be pushing for in the budget. Um, we do, and Erin will touch on this, have some intentions of getting out there on International Women's Day um, to meet with legislators and, and support causes. But uh, from your perspective, perspective, is there anything in particular that um, we could be doing as a group or individuals um, to be showing our support for these priorities to help push them through to get them uh, into the budget? Absolutely. You know, uh, public uh, support is critically important for almost every bill, right? Because our point is to serve the public. That's why we're here. We are representatives of our communities. And so if it's clear that our communities are also asking for it in different areas, uh, that makes our case that much stronger to do it. Uh, so one way is always reaching out to local papers, whether that's writing uh, letters to the editors, LTEs, uh, or finding even stories locally in your communities that show the reason why for someone who, want, who is willing to talk about something. Uh, or an example or a business that's doing something that would really benefit from uh, this piece of legislation, talking to local reporters. But kind of the, the easiest way there is our letters to the editor. You know, I think those are always great, especially in things like the Times Union um, and others, because those are papers that many people in Albany and the governor's team read regularly. And so when we can show that there's a ground 12 community support, uh, that's great. You know, and if there's if there's our bills that you're interested on, you know, we can always help coordinate with you uh, to my my communications director, Bianca, who is the one sharing the information in the chat. Uh, we're happy to coordinate uh, that. And then, of course, you know, sending messages and calling and emailing uh, the governor's office uh, specifically. You know, I think about child care is a big one. Um, home care, fair pay for home care is another one. We haven't really talked too much about home care workers. That's a big priority of mine. It's a bill that's carried by Senator May. Uh, out in Syracuse, but making sure that we're actually paying our home care workers a fair and living wage, because I think it's 60, the report just came out, 60% of open health care jobs are actually in home care work. And uh, especially if you know, when we live in upstate, you live in maybe more rural areas or even more suburban areas, uh, access to home care workers uh, are, are really difficult. I can tell my personal story of when we took care of my father, passed away in 2017, uh, our home care workers were our, life, our lifeline. Uh, my mom became his primary caregiver, uh, but we were coordinating with people who lived three hours away, uh, you know, because there was no one more locally. We were trying to figure out different schedules. It's really difficult. There's such a need uh, for home care workers, especially as we have an aging population and for people who are living at home who are differently abled. And so uh, that's a big priority of ours to going into the budget, uh, which is a long winded way of saying emailing and calling uh, the governor's office is great. 
Uh, and then any types of public displays too uh, are really wonderful and especially in kind of the, the places like papers and such that they're looking at. Great, and I know um, from discussions with Peter, there is United Way does have, um, I believe it's called uh, Voter Voice coming out uh, to help kind of streamline and get people's voices out there in terms of reaching out to legislators and, and the governor's office and being able to do that in kind of a systematic way to, to get our messages out there and, and what we're supporting. So hopefully that'll be coming soon in a way that we can help um, to support some of those priorities that you have. So like I said, I wanted to be cognizant of the time and, and we're just a couple minutes over here. Uh, thank you so much, Senator Hinchy, for joining us. This has been a, a great conversation. Um, we've, I've really enjoyed this discussion with you. Uh, thank you for taking so many of our questions and for all of the information that you've shared. Um, we look to maybe doing this as a yearly thing if you're up for it. <laughs> uh, you love you know, it. A yearly review uh, with the Senator Hinchy to, to give us some priorities once uh, we hear from the governor and before some but the budget is finalized. So that, that'd be great. Um, so I will kind of close our portion of it now and turn it back over to Aaron, who uh, I know who has uh, a couple of last words. Um, and I'm sorry, Senator, if there's any last points you want to make, I should have tossed it back to you first. Uh, thank you. If you have any last words, um, feel free, and then we'll toss it back over to Aaron. <laughs> Sure, I'll just quickly say thank you so much for, for having me. It's it's great, I think this is a wonderful forum. I'm happy to be here. Hopefully the next time we can do something all in person. Uh, I know we're, we're eager to do that, but I really appreciate uh, the space. I really appreciate the questions. Again, if uh, we touched on something that you wanna learn more about or you have follow-up questions or we could be helpful, please call or email us. Uh, we're always here. You know, We've helped over 2,100 people, different uh, constituents with different issues. Uh, that's what we're here for. Uh, that's our goal. So please uh, reach out, let us know how we can be helpful if there's uh, legislative ideas and challenges that you're facing. Uh, two questions about homeowner assistance and ERAP assistance and uh, what, what's happening just generally uh, in the state. Please give us a call. And just again, really appreciate the time and it's great to be with you all. Thanks so much, Erin, over to you. <laughs> yes, no, thank you. Um, I will echo all of the gratitude that we have for everybody to take time out of their day, their work day, um, to be here for this discussion. Thank you, Senator Hinchy. Thank you, Alicia. And thank you all the attendees. Um, as Alicia just mentioned, this is just start of our work. And it's so nice to have a, a partner, if you will, Senator, to know that you can, and we wanna help and support you. I love the idea, the Universal Child Care Act, and maybe if our group can help push that bill and how we can do that. I know on International Women's Day, on March 8th of this year, we, we are hoping to come in full force. If we can't come to the um, Capitol itself, then maybe it's a virtual option. You mentioned sort of showing up in different ways, whether we, ha we can write letters, Letters, we are happy to do that. So maybe follow up from this meeting. Um, we can talk about what is needed. I know we're um, not the largest group, but we're looking to see how we can uh, make a, a big impact. And it's sometimes just a conversation um, that can sort of help with that. Um, for anybody who did join this conversation today and are interested in how they can join Women United or can help out with our initiatives for 2022, there is some information in the chat box. I put my personal email as well. I'm interested in getting this conversation going with you. So um, please reach out if you have any interest at all. Um, Senator Hinchy, we will definitely do this annually. I heard the agreement there. So um, it's a nice kickoff for our advocacy committee. And although child care is our focus for this year, we know there are several different topics and I don't wanna all call them problems, but different ways that we can help our communities. So it would be nice to sort of piggyback off of some of your priorities as well in your office and how we can um, sort of put that into our forefront. So thank you all for joining. If you have any questions, any follow-up insight, we got to almost all of the questions. Um, I will, maybe I'll send over the one that we couldn't get to is a little bit more about feminine hygiene project um, products, but um, yes, I guess I'm just grateful for everybody for joining and we will be in touch after this. Hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.